Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Inside Procurement, our video series where we speak to the procurement leaders of today about the issues that matter most. We're back in the second of our series of videos with Paul Coppins, where we explore a number of different critical issues uh, that are particularly relevant given all that's gone on over the last year with COVID and the economic changes that have taken place and where we're headed as we go forward. So welcome back, Paul. Thank you, Omer. Happy to be here. So in today's video, we are going to talk about the topic of category management. Um, and now this is an idea that's really evolved and in many ways become more salient, much more strategic uh, in recent years. Um, and I'm curious, from your perspective, Paul, I mean, uh, you've had clearly a, a fantastic career at J&J. You now run your own consulting firm, 4PX Consulting. Um, as you reflect on your experience, how has this idea of category management changed? How has it evolved over the years for the procurement profession? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. And uh, when I go back 20 years in time, when I started in procurement, okay, I was this local buyer at the plant over here in Belgium. I was responsible for certain subcategories in packaging materials. And I was dealing with those suppliers. And basically, I, I had to take care of four things, ensure a reliable, a reliable supply with qualitatively great product, source at the best price possible, uh, support suppliers in managing the inventory uh, of our company, and with the key suppliers, introduce at least some sort of supplier scorecard um, in order uh, for me to work with them to, to become better. Mm. And in most cases, I was trying to work with the supplier base that I knew, um, and when it was not needed to change, you just move forward uh, with the suppliers you, you had in your current base. However, things started, started to change and we started to collaborate at the uh, European level um, in order to try to leverage better. Now, as you can imagine, uh, one thing that's happened is Every site, every buyer has his own little favorite suppliers and you want to stick to those. It's a normal way uh, of, of doing business. I was like that. My colleagues were like that. But it doesn't work that way if you want to collaborate. And we started to grow not only in MEA, we brought on the Americas and Asia back at some point in time. So what you needed at that point in time was a great playbook that really explained what is category management all about. And that's how it started to grow. Um, important to realize is this is not a one-shot deal. Um, it really takes time uh, to get there. But if you have these uh, playbooks in front of you, if you train your workforce uh, in a proper way uh, to deal with it, how it's being used, you will be very successful. And working at J&J, I can tell you this has been a, a long journey, but a fantastic journey where people start to collaborate at a global level. Um, and this is the only way uh, forward, I would say. It's not only good for you as a company, but think of the power towards your suppliers as well, being able to leverage not only at the local level, but also uh, at the global level. So it's the only way forward, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, that's actually a great example in terms of how we evolve from local sourcing into now global sourcing and, and, and the issues that that created and, and what that means from a category management perspective. So, so with that, what would you say are some of the key elements that define strong category management? I think it will be important for every category to really look at a number of, of parameters that should be part of a very sound category strategy. In my opinion, those elements are, first of all, what does the business really want? Um, and how am I going to translate that into my category strategy? And you need to know about the priorities that the business had. 
uh, what are the performance needs they want for their operations, what is the current strategy, if I have one, uh, and how is that helping us to get there, uh, and how will the future strategy help us to create value for the business. Now, a second bullet is really about um, what does my current supply market and industry analysis look like? Uh, I need to be able as a category leader to answer questions in terms of the market dynamics that we have today and the opportunities for the future. Um, how can we leverage to meet the business requirements? Uh, a third aspect that should never be uh, forgotten is what are my strategic options and choices that will help fulfill the needs and what is my supplier management strategy to really get there? Um, and all of that needs to be translated then in a list of initiatives and linked to that a great implementation plan uh, that should be tracked then over the months and years to come um, and also have a clear uh, strategy in terms of when do I need to revisit the strategy that I put together today? Because yeah. Strategy of today may not be valid in five years from now or even earlier. So you need uh, to relook at that. So in a nutshell, for me, great category management, you need to be able to translate uh, the business needs. You need to get some good standards, tools, and templates to optimize the effort. And of course, you need to put the material and the resources there to gain those new insights that support the transformational thinking. And last but not least, get alignment, not only in procurement, but with your key stakeholders and business partners. Because without that alignment, there's no such thing as a strategy. Yeah. I mean, back to what we talked about in our first video, um, that whole aspect of cross-functional collaboration, uh, certainly collaboration within the procurement team and, and at all levels of the organization, but then beyond as well is, is absolutely essential. Now, everything that you walk through uh, in terms of the elements and characteristics of strong category management, it makes perfect sense. It's quite a lot of work and it's quite a lot of strategic work that has to get done. And what that, um, I think what that leads to is the question of, well, okay, if I'm a category leader and if that's what I need to do, right? And I, and, and I think we all want that. We all wanna be strategic in the things that we focus on spend more on that time on that and less time on the tactical work. I think it inevitably begs the question of, okay, where do I spend my time? What is core versus non-core, particularly in this context of delivering strong category management? How do you, how do you think about that, that debate of core versus non-core, of what I should be doing as a category leader versus what I should not be spending time on? No, exactly, Omer. And uh, one of the first steps in the category strategy playbook is really segmenting your supplier base because indeed you cannot tackle all the suppliers in the same way. You need to segment them. And in the past, we segmented, for example, into three tiers only. We really had our key strategic suppliers that we really wanted to innovate with. Um, and those were also fully sponsored by, by top management. Um, those suppliers we would also develop further uh, to, to make sure they would become larger uh, and were set up for growth. The second tier we had were the suppliers delivering critical materials and services. Um, we still wanted to have a good relationship with them because of the fact they were delivering critical materials. Um, and the focus was really on deploying further their capabilities. And in a third tier, we had really the transactional suppliers, which in case something happens, it's very easy to switch them out with others. So you don't do anything specific rather than measuring their basic performance on motive and quality, for example. Now, whether you segment into three or four tiers, I've seen different models uh, out there. You just need to see what works best for your company and, and take it from there, but then really stick to the playbook. But if you do that right, that segmentation, it will go a long way. And don't forget key strategic suppliers in every category. You're not going to have 30 of them. Eh? You really need to be picky 
uh, and, and make sure you, you select the right ones. Certainly. So one aspect of that core versus non-core is you spend your time on the suppliers and the relationships and the products and categories that most matter, that are most relevant uh, to, and that's going to drive impact for the organization. Uh, and I think that makes perfect sense. I think there's probably multiple aspects that we can touch on, which we can talk about in future conversations around where you spend your time uh, in specific activities. But certainly the starting point is exactly that, which is what are the suppliers, who are the suppliers that are most strategic to what I do and where I should spend my time? And, I, and that makes sense. How do you see tools like market intelligence and analytics allowing category leaders to cut through all of that? There's a lot of noise that's going to come through. And how do you, how do you think about using market intelligence and analytics to really drive value and, and, and focus on the core activity? Yeah. No, uh, again, an excellent question. And we, without the right market intelligence, you don't come to a very sound uh, category strategy. So it's an integral part of the strategy to analyze your current market, but also have the insights on how that market potentially will change over the years. And that's where MI comes in. And you could argue who needs to do that. Uh, you could say it's the job of the category leaders to, to go through all of that. I, I would say, yes, he should know and he will know, but is it really his job to, to dive deep and to spend his time while it could be more important to spend the time with stakeholders and, and discuss really the outcomes of MI? So that's where, in my opinion, companies like the Smart Cube uh, really come in very handy, I would call. Mm -hmm. And as you know, in the past, we and, and still today, we're making full use uh, of, of you guys. You have a specialized workforce. Eh? Uh, and on top of that, the tools and the databases needed to get to that sort of analysis. So the magical question really comes forward. I should outsource this uh, as a company because I want to do it right and I want to get to all the information that is out there. And I definitely cannot do this uh, on, on my own. The time that I can use differently to look to other aspects of my strategy is much more critical. So the work the Smart Cube has done in the past for me and also for all my colleagues uh, was outstanding. But as you know, we had a dedicated team of a few people that was constantly in touch with you. They were kind of the bridge between the Smart Cube and the category leader to really support the category leader and his or her team uh, for those topics that were really um, being discussed at that time. So uh, moving forward, I think this will only continue to grow and will uh, continue to make use uh, of that. Think as well of all the market intelligence that you guys are offering in terms of commodity pricing and evolution uh, of, of those prices for buyers and category leaders to become better in managing price fluctuation. This is so critical and is a big part of contract negotiations. And that piece of information helps us to define a good agreement. I'm convinced using services like yours are indispensable. We will never become that good as a company in getting to these data as, as you really are. There is a strong need for this. And I remember over 15 years ago now when Gotham gave me a call and asked, hey, Paul, can we talk? And so we met and obviously he was looking for business and I didn't have immediately something uh, that I was going for, but then Gotham is a great sales guy. And I really, he really made me curious. And I wanted to know, my God, is a smart cube really as good as he claims they are? So I went to ask my VP for uh, a small budget. And I said, I have this project. And the project was about, I needed to find a contract packer, a GMP contract packer in a range of 20 miles around our offices. Of course, I did 
pretty well know uh, who I was going for, but I said, Gotham, this is your project. Tell me what you find. And we had a whole list of requirements those suppliers need to comply with. And after a while, he came back and I can tell you, you guys nailed it. Um, you got all the suppliers that I had in mind. And on top of that, you even proposed some suppliers that I never heard of. So. I guess that was the start of something beautiful that only grew uh, over uh, the number of years. And I'm happy we are um, still collaborating. So I'm a strong believer companies should outsource certain activities they feel they cannot spend the time on or they uh, cannot go deep enough because of the lack uh, of knowledge and tools. And uh, you guys are offering this. so. I'm convinced that in the future, this will continue uh, to be the case. All right, well, let's wrap up exactly on that note. And uh, thanks very much, Paul, for your thoughts on this topic of category management. We'll be back soon with our next video, which is gonna be focused on the topic of risk.